Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. Okay, Addison Chow, you beautiful psychopath, I'll do the damn video. Christmas is coming up and obviously Addison is trying to make sure he doesn't end up on the wrong side of Santa's bolter. No, I suppose I haven't seen such fealty to His Holiness the Emperor in quite a while on this channel, but mostly because we haven't done a 40k video in months. We at Generation Films have learned to take a hint when the Keyboard Inquisition comes a-calling from the depths of Cadia, insisting we give tribute to the Emperor. These requests are ones you don't want to let fester, let they should result in an actual Inquisitor knocking on your door. So yes, we're going to discuss whether or not the actions of the Imperium of Man and those who guide its progress are justified. Now you might say, whoa, whoa, uh, American Ben, what do you mean, whether or not? Perhaps you would like an Inquisitor to help you clear up any confusion you might have? Well, actually, I'd prefer not to go that route, but listen, I am mostly going to make an argument here in favor of the Imperium, but this cannot be one of our usual Humanity First videos in which we completely vindicate the side of mankind and eviscerate all things Xeno, as emotionally fulfilling as that might be. The truth is that 40k lore is comprehensive enough that it's hard to make general assertions one way or another about an entity as vast as the Imperium of Man. So let's investigate the Imperium's constituent parts and examine just how right or wrong its leaders are. Obviously, this is something we could devote a whole month to if we wanted, but nay, we're opting for the heresy route, and instead I'm going to give the best overview of my personal thinking that I can, and you can continue the debate in the comments below. The Emperor have mercy on all of our souls for the hell war that is about to unfold. But first, His Holiness sends a message. Do you see this phone right here? This is a phone of champions. I mean, it's from 2016, literally ages ago. It takes worse pictures than a toaster, and whenever I make calls, it gives me an electric shock. But it's a goddamn phone of champions. Why? Because in it lies Raid Shadow Legends. When you install this game, 500 unique, tiny, mystical warriors climb inside of your phone to bring you epic action whenever you should so choose to venture into the land of Teleria. So give your phone new life by clicking my links down below to download Raid on mobile or PC and build your team of champions, or else I'm gonna die. Okay, I can't back that up, but just download Raid. Oh, and each of the champions offers a completely different gaming experience. You can take control of some of the most badass and terrifying creatures in existence, whether honorable dwarves, vicious bears, or yes, redheads. It's the holidays, my friends, and the developers at Raider in the Christmas spirit, which means 14 brand new champ- Whoa, is that a jacked anthropomorphic warrior reindeer? How are you not playing this game yet? Seriously though, Raid has just released their biggest update ever, which includes the Doom Tower. 120 floors and 12 nightmarish bosses lie ahead for you to traverse. Kind of symbolic for the 12 months of 2020, huh? But don't worry, this is a video game, not real life. So the Raid team is going to help you out by giving away a special champion just for this occasion. Bulwark, the bringer of death and part-time accountant. So listen, stop what you're doing, even if you're in the middle of heart surgery, and hit that link in the description to get the game. And for a limited time, you can also get a free Void Champion, an XP Booster, 50 Gems, some Energy Refills, and an Ancient Shard. Act now, because those goodies will only be available in your inbox for the next 30 days. I'll see you in the game. Now back to the main content of the video. First, what is the Imperium of Man? Well, it's an interstellar human empire that exists tens of thousands of years into the future when mankind has settled in parts all over the Milky Way galaxy, which itself is beset with forces that threaten the existence of humanity. There's the Xenos, alien races aplenty such as the barbaric orcs and the malevolent Dark Eldar. Then even worse, there's the Chaos Gods and their demon servants who dwell in the Warp, an alternate dimension composed of psychic energy. And from this realm at times, these energies break into real space to terrorize mankind and even Xenos. But I don't need to turn this video into a whole explainer on the Imperium of Man. The simple point that I want to emphasize is that the future is hellish, and the types of government and policy that work in today's world won't necessarily be as effective in tomorrow's galaxy. Now before we get into a general examination of the Imperium's different elements, we need to actually define what we mean by the question, is the Imperium of Man right? 
What does right actually mean? Oh yeah, we're about to get philosophicational. Well, often when you ask people this question, especially in terms of political philosophy, a respondent will answer that doing what's right means to take the action that best serves their personal system of values. And these values will then inform their political views. The problem is, values and how to apply them in order to make moral policy are also in dispute. This is why almost every policy, to some degree, even murder policy, invites criticism and debate. For instance, some people think you should be able to murder people who put pineapple on pizza, and others don't. Honestly, there's good points on both sides. But anyway, the definition of being moral in one's political or governmental philosophy depends on what outcomes one wants to achieve. Do you view moral ends as those outcomes which result in some sort of gain for the most amount of individuals in society? As in perhaps it's your primary goal that as many people as possible have the sufficient wealth to be considered rich. On the other hand, maybe you view moral ends as those outcomes which result in some sort of gain for the entire group. As in perhaps it's your policy goal to ensure the maximum amount of human progress. I think the Imperium's goal falls more under this category, which is supposedly to ensure humankind's survival. This is a debate within utilitarianism itself. It could be argued that the result of all these options I just listed would be to the benefit of the greatest total welfare to individuals in society. So this is not so much a question of philosophical school of thought. It's more a question of what you believe the responsibility of government and really what humanity's overall purpose is. If you believe that humans have a collective purpose and that that purpose is to be happy, then you might believe the Imperium of Man is in the wrong because it is willing to sacrifice billions of human beings in order to achieve its goal of perpetuating humanity. Billions. Okay, that's kind of a big deal. Then again, one could still argue that if humans don't survive, then they can't be happy because they don't exist. Thus, implementing policy that leads to pain and suffering for humans could actually be what results in their greatest happiness. I know that sounds paradoxical, but think about it. Why do you make the sacrifices you do in your life? Why do you forego pleasure sometimes to work or study? For the glory of his holiness, the god emperor of mankind, duh! Come on, you know what I mean. You make such sacrifices for the prospect of future happiness. Sometimes immediate happiness can imply later suffering and vice versa. Of course, if you believe humanity has an intrinsic purpose and that that purpose is exploring the universe, then you might support policy that doesn't so much focus on making people feel happy in the short or long term. You most likely won't advocate for policies that cater to human sensitivities and feelings. You won't support policies that subvert the overall production of an economy for the sake of taking care of individuals. Then again, of course, it's more complicated than that because here we could also argue that treating people well, and in some cases even sacrificing short-term production, could lead to the most amount of long-term progress and ultimately exploration into deep space. As I alluded to earlier, the questions that we are asking in this video are not easy to answer. As you can see, there's many different purposes that people can posit for mankind, and it's very hard to pinpoint which policy goes with which purpose because it's not actually completely clear which policies will lead to which ends. And that, my friends, is the cause of so much madness in present-day society that I cannot even begin to tell you. Everyone thinks they have it all figured out, and yet no one does. I mean, many religious people see human purpose as salvation, or to be saved in some sort of otherworldly realm transcendent of physical life, and they ground their political philosophies in these beliefs. You can imagine that the policies proposed by such people wouldn't always result in such immediate happiness for people. I mean, what is life anyway when there's a reward of eternal heaven waiting for you in the afterlife? So suffer in life. Don't renounce your religion even under torture, because in death you will be compensated for your pain. But anyway, there's no real point in going too in-depth discussing political philosophy or the nature of human purpose. As long as you understand how convoluted and paradoxical all of these things can be, and how your personal political philosophy and vision of human purpose will inform your stance as to whether or not the Imperium of Man is in the right. And I mean, the very answer to all of this is probably something along the lines of we need all of these philosophies to conflict with each other and balance out in order to have the strongest possible society. That said, there are some policies that we can say are probably more likely to result in certain ends than other ones. For instance, if I believe that the purpose of humanity is to survive and explore the universe, and thus I believe that moral decisions are ones that lead to that end, then I probably would want to do something in the way of building up arms and a military, and of course, funding a healthy space program. 
Now here you might say to me, no, 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 American Ben, American Ben. First, we need to debate larger questions about how to form an economy and how to enact policy that motivates people to build superior weapons and study science in the first place. But what I'm saying to you is that those answers are not entirely clear. I mean, yes, it does seem like we can say that countries with freer markets, I don't want to say capitalism because I think this is kind of a broad and silly term, but freer markets seem to lead to the most amount of innovation via competition, which of course would be best for our purpose of spreading humanity throughout the universe. Just how free should markets be though? Well, that's more up in the air, and there's an entire spectrum of possibilities. Okay, so let's return to the 42nd millennium here. The Milky Way galaxy is in a state of war, chaos demons haunt warp space, and violent xenos pervade real space. Life in this time is hell. To be alive is to be ready to die. Hell yeah, for the emperor! And yet 40k fans, the madmen they are, want nothing more than to be inserted into this reality. I love you guys. But I digress. The question we need to ask is, for the purpose of preventing the extinction of humanity and for a bulwarking human society against the entities that threaten it, is the Imperium of Man implementing the right policies? Let's start with our God Emperor and work our way down. Now, I do understand that what is to follow may very well be some of my final words. But shall I be disappeared for what some will call treason, then please know I see my actions as the highest form of patriotism. For I only critique for the sake of mankind itself. Death. The Emperor, as you know, is the nominal ruler of the Imperium. He's a psychic human whose badly damaged body only remains alive thanks to the cybernetic life support mechanisms of his golden throne. Still, the Emperor is left unable to actively rule, and so he leaves the day-to-day -day responsibilities of managing the Imperium to the Senatorum Imperialis, a council made up of the High Lords of Terra. It is these officials who make big picture policy decisions for the trillions of humans across the galaxy. That said, despite the massive bureaucracy that makes up the Imperium of Man from the High Lords down, it's impossible for this single governmental body to closely manage all one million plus worlds that make up the Imperium. Thus, the Imperium takes the form of an interstellar tribute empire, a semi-feudal system under which member worlds are left to largely govern themselves under the condition that they recognize the authority of the Emperor and support the Imperial cult, the weird Emperor-worshipping state religion. These worlds must also supply the Imperium with troops and resources, a tax known as the Imperial Tithe. Now, I don't want to give anyone the idea that despite the autonomy that individual human worlds wield, that the Milky Way galaxy is brimming with democracy. It's not, and largely Imperial worlds reflect the government of the Imperium. They're oligarchic in nature, and it's rare that anyone outside of a small group of the wealthiest people exercises any power in society. Of course, with all of these unchecked governmental bodies holding power over peoples, from the Senatorum Imperialis down to the ruling establishments of individual worlds, one should probably expect that the Imperium is rife with corruption, evil men and women thriving, and a lack of competition. No doubt this is true. However, remember, our question is, is the Imperium set up to best prevent human extinction? And yes, I am implying that it's possible that a system with widespread corruption could still be the best system for ensuring mankind's survival. If we're being philosophical, we can't rule that out. I cannot say, for instance, that successful democracy is possible in the Imperium. I mean, in the present, there's no extinction-level threat, but in 40k, these types of threats are omnipresent and catastrophic events are a daily occurrence. I think it's possible that in order to keep the Imperium unified, and in order to competently manage a galactic war against aliens and demons alike, that a more authoritarian government is necessary. Dare I say, democracy isn't always so great at running a war, despite the recent sterling record of Western democracies in the Middle East, of course. The Imperium simply cannot afford to deal with people who criticize and oppose their war efforts and want to curb the government's military spending and demand orc rights. Survival is on the line, and the Imperium needs to be able to carpet bomb without restraint. And of course, they also need to be able to live by the old saying, when in doubt, exterminatus. So it's possible that when it comes to the Imperium, we might have a case in which the sacrifice of the individual's freedom and welfare is necessary for the long-term survival of the individual species. Baby Yoda shouldn't have eaten the eggs! And hey, it's impossible to know how another form of government would have fared from the time of the Imperium's inception in the 30th millennium onward, but when I look at the military that the Imperium has produced, it's not easy for me to assume that they could have done much better with different policies or a different governmental structure. 
The Imperial Navy has battle fleets that rival some of the best that the Xenos have to offer, and the Astra Militarum is filled with elite units and hordes of humans who are fantastic at, well, dying in the name of humanity. Best dyers ever! And then of course there's the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines, who are gods among men and can face down any threat in existence. So yes, billions of humans are used by the Imperium as cannon fodder in their war against the Xenos, but it's hard to say that this isn't justified if the alternative is extinction. Now if you believe that it isn't so important that humanity continue on into the future, then yeah, you could make an argument that the Imperium subjects would be better served by not being sacrificed to the God Emperor's war effort. Perhaps many, even most worlds, wouldn't come into contact with any threats for generations. But in the long run, humanity would probably not be best ensuring its collective survival without structuring its entire empire around its military. I want to highlight the example of the Qin Dynasty in ancient China here to help us contextualize some of the decisions that the Imperium had to make in preparation for war. The Qin, the first dynasty of Imperial China, arose out of the Warring States period, an era in Chinese history that lasted roughly between the years of 481 and 221 BC. The period was defined by seven major states competing for dominance over Chinese peoples and territory. These states included the Yan, Zhao, Qi, Chu, Han, Wei, and Qin. By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet! Captain Planet! In the mid-4th century BC, Lord Shangyan, a Qin statesman, began advocating a policy known as Qin legalism, which encouraged taking a practical and aggressive approach to warfare. According to historian William Scott Morton, dude does the three-name thing, so definitely trust him, at the time, the prevailing philosophy among the different states was to treat war as a gentleman's game, which meant observing heaven's laws in battle. For the sake of brevity, this basically meant respecting one's opponent and not necessarily doing whatever it takes to win. Rather, fighting honorably was more important. Well, pardon my French, but the Chin said, f that, we're kicking all your asses. They focused their state's efforts on building up their military and weapons, perhaps even at the sake of other important aspects of society, and they attacked and conquered all of the other states, leading to the unification of China under Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi, the Chinese's very own god emperor of mankind. Now think about this. Were the leaders of the other states moral for upholding the tradition of honoring the gentleman's rules of battle? Or were they immoral for maintaining such traditions and thus leaving their people exposed to attack from the outside, notably by the Qin? Obviously, after being conquered, these states certainly didn't get to have a hand in choosing policy one way or another. Yet, had they neglected their values and committed their people to war more aggressively for the sake of survival, perhaps their state would have become a more ruthless place to exist, or their government would have been less competent, and that would have led to a collapse anyway. Now, of course, I'm not saying that the people of any state in 3rd century BC China were exactly living the high life. But anyway, then when it comes to the Qin, here's an example of a kingdom in which all of its citizens didn't necessarily thrive, but it had a strong, capable military and the other resources necessary to conquer territory and thus secure the perpetuation of its people. It's almost as if the Qin were justified simply because they won. So the Imperium too is thus right, no? After all, they're focusing their efforts on building up their military might for the sake of the long-term survival of their people. Well, actually, we can't make any sort of explicit statement in the affirmative here. You see, while the Imperium's military is definitely impressive, the larger empire of mankind has fallen into disrepair. Technological and scientific progress has stagnated. I mean, the Adeptus Mechanicus is completely clueless, and Xeno empires are threatening to usurp humanity as the supreme force in the galaxy. The Imperium in the 42nd millennium is actually not holding up so well, and to go along with external threats, there's also bubbling rebellion from within the human empire. And I have to assume that the Imperium's deterioration has at least something to do with its repressive nature, its rampant corruption, lack of competition, and poor leadership. So no, we can't say that the Imperium is unequivocally right. But I also can't so readily criticize the Imperium either, because who knows? Just because their empire is collapsing doesn't necessarily mean that an alternative system of government or different policies would have resulted in a better outcome for humanity. After all, under the Imperium, humanity has already persisted for thousands of years living among existential threats. That said, maybe the Imperium would be better served with a more republican system of government with a federalist design where power is distributed both vertically and horizontally across the empire. Maybe under such a form of government, all of the different human worlds could indeed achieve effective collective action, despite there being no authoritarian body to compel them to do so. 
It's hard to say, but what we can say is that humanity under the Imperium as is, is still around. And I think that counts for something. The Qin Dynasty, on the other hand, well, it lasted for only about 15 years before collapsing shortly after the death of Qin Shi Huangdi. Perhaps then the Imperium should take a lesson not to invest all of their hopes in a single individual. And there it is, my friends, heresy worthy of capital punishment. So it's time for me to quickly end this video and say, bring on your bolters, you bastards. Anyways, do give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. I don't even think I have to tell you to comment. I cannot wait to see what y'all have to say about this video. Um, thanks again to Raid for sponsoring this video. Subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell. For now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.